Coming up on DTNS, Science Week finishes with a flourish as Riley Black talks to us about using tech to find out more about dinosaurs, plus how the internet's holding up with all this increased use, and Google and Apple team up on a track and trace app. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 10th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us today, very happy to have Riley Black, author of Skeleton Keys and My Beloved Brontosaurus. Welcome, Riley. Thanks for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me here. We are uh, going to be talking about how to find some creature bones with technology. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> A little later in the show. Uh, we were just talking about uh, the Star Wars universe and uh, whether a psychiatrist replaced J.J. Abrams on Star Wars. Uh, that's all in our wider conversation on Good Day Internet. But get that by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know, and I'll play the right music to go with it. There we go. Amazon is developing a lab to test for COVID-19 and hopes to begin testing small numbers of its frontline employees soon. Amazon says that the system may not reach full capacity before the pandemic subsides, though. The company will implement antigen testing to determine whether a person is infected, not whether they have been infected. Following on renaming Hangouts Meet to Google Meet, Google has renamed Hangouts Chat to... Say it with me, Google Chat. What? Uh, these renamings apply to the G Suite products. The Hangouts brand is still around, referring to the consumer chat app that was spun out of Google Plus back in 2013. Uh, that's the one that's a successor to G Chat. But uh, yes, slowly, fewer <laughs> Hangouts to confuse you in the world. Google also launched a virtual Braille keyboard for Android so that blind and low vision users can type on phones without additional hardware. It's part of an update to the Android accessibility suite on devices running Android 5.0 or newer. The, device, uh, the keyboard rather uses a standard six key layout and each key represents one of six Braille dots with tapping combinations used to make letters and swipes used to delete letters and words or make spaces. Google has created a portal to help New York State deal with unemployment applications. The state says it's seen a 16 thousand percent increase in phone calls and a 1600 percent increase in web traffic in recent weeks to that system new york state is also working with deloitte to open additional call centers and with verizon to increase phone ports for the department of labor from 1750 to more than 10,000 ports Instagram announced Friday it's rolling out direct message access on the web to all users globally after testing the feature with a smaller group of users since January. The web layout includes an emoji keyboard and gallery view of photos and videos to resemble the mobile version of your favorite DMs. Google also announced it's further extending free access to some advanced Google Meet features. They were supposed to be free until July 1st. Now they're free until September 30th. All G Suite and G Suite for Education customers can host meetings using Meet with up to 250 participants live stream to up to 100,000 people with a single domain and save meeting recordings to Google Drive for free. A team of engineering students from UC Berkeley designed a conversion kit to retrofit sleep apnea machines into ventilators for patients with milder COVID-19 symptoms, which frees up capacity for more critical cases. Teams at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and Emory University Medical Center in Atlanta are modifying sleep apnea machines as well. According to a March 24th FDA emergency use authorization, these devices are approved for use in treating COVID-19 as they've already been approved for hospital use. And Facebook launched a quiet mode, a feature that lets mobile app users mute push notifications for a set period of time. You can set quiet mode duration each time you use the feature or run it automatically at set times. Feature is included in a new Your Time on Facebook section of the app, which also shows charts on your Facebook usage, how often you open the app, and a weekly activity log. All right, let's talk a little more about that Apple-Google thing I mentioned at the beginning of the show. Let's do it. Apple and Google are cooperating on a decentralized system to track the spread of COVID-19. The system uses Bluetooth low energy, or BLE, transmissions to send and receive a rotating number. This might start to sound familiar. If a user reports being diagnosed with COVID-19, alerts can be sent to another phone that had been in range 
of the infected person's phone. Matches are conducted on device. The system doesn't store master lists on servers or share any identifiable information. Android and iOS APIs will arrive in mid-May for use by health authorities apps. The companies will also work on building the functionality into the OS, eliminating the need for a user to download an app to participate as well as bring battery life and privacy protection advantages. The entire system is opt-in, and Google and Apple both will publish information about their work for independent review. Yeah, they, if this does sound familiar, it's because it's very similar to the MIT app uh, that we mentioned on yesterday's show, although it's not the same. Uh, that app is not part of what Google and Apple are doing, but it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought Ariel Waldman yesterday did a great job of explaining what some of the limitations are with using technology, and she she advocated for having human interviews be part of this. Casey Newton, also at The Verge today, wrote a column talking about the limitations of using technology, particularly Bluetooth. Problem with GPS is it's privacy invading because you are actually logging location. The brilliance of this approach that Google and Apple are using is you never associate it with an identity and you don't have to know the geolocation. All you have to know is, did this phone come in close to this phone? And that's the weakness here that Ariel and Casey both were talking about, which is 40 feet for Bluetooth can mean a lot of false positives. Uh, because you might not even be the same room as, per, as someone and still get a ping. Uh, right. You could be uh, below them in a multi-story building. So Casey, I, I, I saw had a thread going on Twitter today saying, look, if if there's something helpful about this that the health authorities can say, I'm, I'm all ears. I want to hear that. He's not trying to trash it, but he's saying this isn't a silver bullet to solve things because it's just not as accurate as you would want it to be. You know, it, it, I feel like... I, I, I keep bringing up like, okay, but is it better than nothing? You know, there, there's so mm -hmm. many of these solutions where it's like, this is good. Let's, let's keep innovating. Let's keep trying stuff. Yeah, this sounds like, yeah, the false positive situation or, you know, not wanting to track people to the point that they're identified might be identified uh, later on. And, you know, is this data stored as securely as is being promised? Those are all what ifs. Um, but at the same time, anything that puts us in the direction of having a better idea on how to stop the spread of something that's hurting and killing people, it's hard to say, well, they shouldn't do it until it's perfect. Well, and 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 to to answer that question, uh, Casey actually tweeted a, a paper from Duke University and a quote from that paper, cell phone based apps recording proximity events between individuals are unlikely to have adequate discriminating ability or adoption to achieve public health utility while introducing serious privacy, security, and logistical concerns. Now, this system from Apple and Google eliminates the adoption part once it's in the operating system, because then it's easy to turn on. It doesn't eliminate it, but it makes it a lot easier. And it eliminates a lot of the privacy and security concerns because it does a good job of protecting anonymity. It's whether that logistical and and accuracy just uh, a part still make it lack that health utility uh, that, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to hear somebody weigh in on that because maybe it's better than nothing, or maybe it just isn't enough better than nothing that it would allow us to change what we're doing now, which is just blanket social distancing. Right, yeah, introducing further confusion, not the goal here. But, Riley, you know, but before we move off of this, how do, you, mm -hmm. how do you feel just in general about using an app like this uh, e with these kinds of protections in place? It kind of makes me wonder about how it's going to get used in the future, because we all know like crisis drives innovation, right? So when you started talking about like your phone will know which phone it's been close to within 40 feet or whatever it is, if that's eventually going to change the way that we get ads and push notifications and things like that, especially when we have like it's Apple and Google and these you know big companies that like that's a large part of what they want to know. So I'm wondering that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that this might be useful for a find, but I doubt that it's just going to go away if it turns out to be successful. I'm kind of curious what the future application of this might be. Not trying to make it sound nefarious. Yeah, yeah. But to me, it sounds like something that, you know, companies that want to push ads and know who's hanging out with who and when and where, um, that's probably relevant information to them. And it might have uh, implications down the line. Well, the good news about this yeah. system is yeah. that it's all done on device. So mm -hmm. you can't you can't get at it if you're okay. Okay. you're Apple or Google, mm -hmm. uh, they and they're only going to allow health companies to have access to it. Okay. Uh, so you know that that's good too. Yeah. But that that thing about turning it off, they can. It's built into the system. is easy to turn off. Mm -hmm. uh, with any of these systems, though, I think that is the ultimate question: is is it? 
-hmm. and and when and and guarding against mission creep where they start to add features to it that weaken the privacy protections and such mm -hmm. uh, but yeah those, those are valid concerns the nonprofit company behind the secure messaging app signal speaking of concerns uh, wrote a blog post Wednesday explaining that a US bill called earn it could force signal out of the United States market if passed earn it is making its way through Congress right now with not a lot of attention on it because we're all distracted by some other very important things. The bill proposes to combat online child exploitation by letting the government determine best practices to combat it. So the government decides what you do about it and companies who don't meet the government standards could lose safe harbor protection. Safe harbor protection is also section 230 in the US of uh, the CDA, which protects the company from being sued for content posted by users. That allows Twitter to exist. That allows Facebook to exist to say, look, we're not gonna have to approve everything on here uh, because we have that safe harbor and allows for conversation. The bill would create a best practices commission to determine what that standard is that would that would allow them to decide whether someone has done enough to protect against online child exploitation. That commission would have to have its determination approved by the head of the FTC, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, and of particular concern to people at Signal, the Attorney General of the United States. Because the bill itself does not target end-to-end -end encryption, which is what Signal uses, but the current U.S. Attorney General, William Barr, opposes letting companies use end-to-end -end encryption unless there is a backdoor for law enforcement. So the fear from Signal is if this got passed as is, uh, it would not allow Signal to get away with end-to-end -end encryption if anyone suspected Signal was being used for online child exploitation. Their right, fear is that- Right, because that's not the best practice. Attorney General Barr would say, uh, the best practice is letting law enforcement see what's happening to these people, and since you use end-to-end -end encryption, you're not letting them see, and therefore you lose your safe harbor. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I know that if Signal just sort of went away in the US market, that would be a pretty big deal. Um, the fact that the company is like, hey, <laughs> we might have to do that, you know, pay attention to what's going on here. And the fact that there seem to be motivating factors on the part of the attorney, uh, US Attorney General, you know, even though it does have to go through approval by a couple other organizations. So yeah, I mean, what what happens? Does it get enough pushback that it gets rewritten? Does Signal just say that this is the way it goes? I mean, it's 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 kind of a crazy situation. It has been modified already under pressure from the EFF and a few others. Uh, what they're pushing for now is to say just carve out an exemption for encryption. The the bill itself isn't isn't a loss. It's trying to do a good thing. You just need to make sure that it doesn't do more harm than it does good. Riley, I know you mentioned it before the show. You use Telegram. That's another app uh, mm -hmm. that uses end to end encryption. Now, how do you feel about this? Unfortunately, I don't really know enough about the particulars. This is a little bit. Um, of, we'll put it this of, way: of, of if Telegram said the same thing as Signal, how would yeah. that make you feel? Uh, I I would be concerned. I've you know ever since I mean, this is not the first time we've had this conversation about allowing uh, backdoors for law enforcement to to go in and get information. And yeah, I am concerned about the abuse of that information that it's being you know pushed for obviously a. a a good reason, but you know, we just talk, used the term uh, mission creep a moment ago, and this is the same thing as sort of, yeah, yeah. I guess, uh, security creep. Like, what what is this also going to allow, and can we predict that and kind of create the protections that we want without opening the door wide open to a whole bunch of things that we don't? A good a good example is there's a law called Kalea that specifically says, uh, and Kalea has to do with. Uh, practices between the United States and trading with other partners, uh, but it says where encryption is in concerned, we're we're carving that out and saying end to end encryption can't be used as a reason to undermine trade, et cetera. Uh, and so they're they're just asking for the same sort of thing to happen with the Earn It Act to say like carve out encryption and don't let that be something that you're setting best practices around, uh, and then people will feel more more comfortable with it. I don't think it fixes all the problems, but it fixes one of the major ones. Yeah, and that might just be the way these things go. It's like you just take the step and take the next step and go go from there. It has to be mm -hmm. functional at some point. Also functional, even more so as of late, the autonomous food delivery startup Starship Technologies, which expanded service to Tempe, Arizona, after expanding to grocery delivery in Washington, D.C., and food delivery in Irvine, California, in late March. Starship originally planned to expand to 100 universities by the summer of 2021. The company will add more cities to service in the coming weeks to meet COVID-19 delivery demands. 
Um, related, Neuro has received a license from the California Department of Motor Vehicles to test its autonomous delivery vehicles in the Silicon Valley communities of Atherton, East Palo Alto, Los Altos Hills, Los Altos itself, Menlo Park, Mountain View, Palo Alto, Sunnyvale, and Woodside. If you're not familiar with the peninsula area of Silicon Valley, it's pretty much all the cities there. The license can't be used until area lockdown measures are lifted, however. Yeah, you're right. We could have just said not San Jose <laughs> right. or Santa Clara. All the other ones, yeah. except the East Bay part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, this this is cool. Uh, robots delivering groceries. And uh, it's expanding to Tempe right now. Unfortunately, Neuro doesn't, like you said, doesn't get to uh, start its new service in California, although Neuro is operating in Houston and was operating in Arizona as well. Uh, so uh, after the lockdown, we're, we're going to see more of these human-free delivery services by robot. Well, uh, this is a time where you're like, oh, this is perfect. You know, we need it now more than ever. But the fact that people are going to go, and that worked well, maybe they won't say it always worked well, but when it does work well, not having to interact with the human and having more of these services expand to different metropolitan areas, uh, this is, it was going this way anyway. It just, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, at, uh, via drone, um, on the ground, uh, in certain cities where there's, you know, kind of a lot of flat land and they're good grids, Arizona cities always seem to pop up when put in that category. This is, this is the, this is the wave, man. Riley, do you want groceries delivered by robot? <laughs> I mean, my grocery store is about two blocks away, so I'd have the excuse to take a walk. But I, 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 when I think about these things, I kind of wonder about the gig economy and the fact that, you know, we have all these people who, you know, yeah. now that we're in the age of talking about automated cars, automated grocery delivery, and all these folks who are on, like, the lower end of the income range, um, what's going to happen for them as, like, this kind of automation continues? And if that's a part of the broader cultural shift that we need to be like, it certainly sounds cool. But, like, I just ordered uh, from Grubhub the other day. I thought, like, well, if my food can be delivered by robot, then what are going to happen to people? Like, that's their job, and that's how they're making their income. Yeah. So it's like, we, what? We, 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 we need jobs it. for those people as we automate these things. Uh, yes. Maybe it's controlling the robots from a command center, but that doesn't there sound like enough. So, yeah, we, that's something we need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. As the world locks down and more people than ever work from home, stream videos and visit friends and family over video conference, the internet has mostly held up. It hasn't been easy. Obviously, we're all experiencing a few more instances of lag and stuttering and dropouts, but this could have been a lot worse. Uh, phone calling has increased as well. You may not realize that, but good old fashioned picking up the phone and talking to somebody without using an app uh, is on the rise too. Verizon is handling 800 million wireless calls a day, uh, more than double the average calls made on a Mother's Day. So every day is twice a Mother's Day in calls. Mother's Day is usually a peak for calling here in the US. Average call length was also up 33% from pre-pandemic averages, so people are talking longer. And AT&T reports it's seen cellular calls increase 35%, and a lot of those are over Wi-Fi. So not only calling more, but also heading out over the internet. Instead of an internet crisis, though, what we're seeing is a scramble to build out capacity. Uh, part of it is because the peak usage hasn't actually risen that much. It's expanded. Cloudflare CEO Matthew Prince told Technology Review that instead of an after work peak of 7.30 p.m., which is what we saw prior to lockdowns, you have a high amount of usage throughout the day. So it used to be kind of a lower usage and then a peak at 7.30 and then it would fall back off. Now, what you're seeing is high usage throughout the day with a peak just before 12. Health checks from RIPE and UCLA who monitor internet traffic show little change uh, in service with just minor slowdowns. So they're, they're built to handle the peak. The fact that the peak happens more often doesn't matter as long as it doesn't go over the capacity. And companies aren't sitting still. Technology Review says data center company Equinix is hurrying a one to two year planned capacity upgrade to 10 to 100 gigabytes to happen in the next couple of weeks. So they were gonna take one to two years to do it. Now they're like, you know what? Let's just do it right now. Let's get it done in a fortnight. Netflix is installing hundreds of extra servers in hubs in each of its regions. Zoom is setting up dedicated connections with some broadband providers. We're seeing internet exchange providers uh, calling on ISPs to do peering with them. We've seen some discounted peering arrangements happening. Upcoming challenges include restrictions that might keep people from repairing cables or fixing servers. 
Uh, in other words, if you can't get to the thing because there is no transport or you're not allowed out, you know, to do the the kinds of social distancing and get what you need done done, uh, supply chain disruptions are another threat. Uh, although China is coming back online, a lot of the shipping is reduced. Not all countries that manufacture are China. So some people that make parts are under lockdowns and, and factories maybe at, at least lower capacity. Uh, and that might make it hard to get hold of parts and equipment. But overall, this this report is good. Uh, the reports are that the internet is holding up. And instead of just sitting around going like, well, we didn't break, uh, the companies that, <laughs> that run the parts of the internet are, are scrambling to try to make sure that they can increase the capacity so that they still have a lot of headroom in case there's some other unexpected spike in usage. The one part of this, uh, this all makes sense. I mean, it was, I was listening to a podcast the other day where it was like, there are all these, you know, internet usage, use of toilet paper, mm. uh, you know, food uh, consumption. It's like, people aren't just like eating seven meals a day all of a sudden or going to the bathroom more <laughs> often or on the internet twice as much. It's like, you know, we're talking about like finite chunks of time here. It's just getting moved around more than anything. I mean, sure, if you had a long commute and maybe you have more time to, to do something else, whether it's work or otherwise, the numbers are going to skew a little bit. The one thing that I don't totally get is the calling increasing as much as it has, unless it's really attributed more than anything to people checking in on each other. Because you can't visit. That is, that is exactly what it's attributed to. Uh, people are calling to to check in, uh, and and yeah, you and I probably are using things like FaceTime and Zoom and stuff like that more often. Right, but a lot of right. people just pick up the phone because that's what they know. Yeah, yeah. No, I guess that makes sense. I mean, my mom and I are doing that all the time. We're calling each other more than we would normally. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and for lots of folks, it seems like in, in my line of work uh, as a writer and you know doing science communication, a lot of folks uh, seem they don't like email or they feel it's relatively impersonal. So it's like, well, just give me a call or something. So yeah. it's like we're just even just getting work done is relying a lot more. A little more human connection there too. Mm -hmm. A little, yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Now, those of you who've been uh, paying attention to Science Week all week long on Daily Tech News Show know we talked to Annalee Newitz about archaeology early in the week. Today, Riley's going to help give us insight in how tech is being used in paleontology. Uh, paleontology, of course, the study of older things than archaeology, right? As a, if, I, if I can give a rough uh, definition. Uh, Pretty uh, much. It's, yeah, it's stuff yeah, from before yeah. we were here. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, humans are part of the fossil record after all, too. We've got a fossil record going back about 7 million years. But generally, the cutoff for what is a fossil, it's totally arbitrary. It's anything older than about 10,000 years okay. from our present point. So, for example, there's some mammoths that are not fossils, and there are some that are, depending on which side of the divide you fall on. Depending on when they fell over. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so tell us about some of the technologies that are having the biggest impact on paleontology. Yeah, paleontology is kind of weird because it's very low tech, high tech at the same time, like doing the field work. It hasn't changed very much over the past hundred years. You still have to go out, you know, get your hiking boots on. I think, you know, the invention of camelback and like things like that to sip from has been the biggest influence <laughs> on field work. But it's more or less the same as we've always done. Once once you get those fossils back to the lab, though, that's when we're getting a lot of really interesting tech, often from medical sciences um, and engineering sciences that we're using to sort of understand how these animals actually live. So now, for example, if you have a totally crushed skull, you know it's complete, but it looks like it's been run over by a truck. You can take each of those individual bones once you've CT scan them and place that back together and see how they fit and come up with a 3D model, which then you can then print of this animal. So it's that kind of stuff that's really allowing us to find and understand and analyze fossils in a way that wasn't possible you know, even 20 years ago. Ground penetrating radar was something that Annalie brought up uh, in regards to archaeology, but it seems like that would be useful in trying to find things that are fossils as well. Yeah, oddly enough, it's Jurassic Park that led, leads a lot of people to ask that question, because if you remember the beginning of that movie, they use ground penetrating radar to find that other raptor skeleton. The thing is, in most cases, fossils, because they're bone that's more or less turned to rock or been mineralized, they're the same density as the surrounding rock. So if you use ground penetrating radar, you're just going to basically get blobs and you can't tell whether it's a stone or a bone or what. There's a couple of cases like a fossil manatee that was found in uh, Egypt, if I remember correctly, where it's worked. But most of the time, it's a lot of equipment and outlay for something that just doesn't really work for, for example, dinosaur fossils because they're so old and so mineralized that it won't pick that signature up. 
Now, you mentioned uh, micro CT scan. Well, you mentioned CT scanning, and I, I, and I yeah. know from reading some of the articles you gave me uh, that micro CT scanning seems to be what's used uh, quite often. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, sure. So it's it's not all that different from uh, CAT scanning. Like if you go to a hospital and you get a CAT scan, you basically create this 3D image of whatever it is that you're scanning. Uh, micro CT scanning just has like that much more resolution to it really. So you can see, for example, the histology of the animal, the bone microstructure. So if you have like an Allosaurus leg bone, you can use a micro CT scan and really look inside that without cutting it open because otherwise we have to break fossils to understand what's inside. So previously up until now, if you wanted to look at the microstructure of that bone, see how fast that animal grew, uh, how many years old it was, you'd have to cut that open, make a slide, grind it down, put it under a microscope. Now you just run it through the scanner, you have that data and you actually basically explore it inside the bone without ever, you know, taking it out of its jacket if you wanted. Yeah, so it's it's completely non-destructive then. Yes, that's right. And we uh, that's something that paleontologists often like, depending on who you ask, uh, use use different terms. Sometimes it's called destructive sampling. Sometimes we call it consumptive sampling because that, that makes curators feel a little bit better <laughs> about what we what we're doing. But that's the <laughs> that's a little to, less drastic. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, the, I mean, because once you, if you're going to cut that bone open, that tooth or whatever it is, you usually make a cast for it first. So that's a whole other process where you have a bone, you make a replica of the whole thing. So that way when you take the chunk out, you still have the exterior anatomy. Now we don't need to do any of that. The big question with micro CT data and other forms of sort of digitization and paleontology is where does this data live and who's going to maintain it? You basically need a virtual museum of all this stuff. And I don't know if we have an answer for that yet. There's no central location. Like the NSF doesn't have a paleontology database where all this is stored for eternity. It's still held by the individual researchers or their schools. So that's a problem that still has to be solved. So it, 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 that sounds like there, there's a, a similar problem in paleontology that there is in, in lots of disciplines, which is how to share the data and who gets to share it with whom. Exactly. And some research groups and researchers are better about this than others. A great example, I think, of sharing data. Uh, there's a baby Parasaurolophus, one of these duck-billed dinosaurs with the big tube off the back of its head. It was a baby, a yearling Parasaurolophus found down uh, in Utah, about four hours away from where I'm sitting. And when they came out the paper, they put it in PeerJ, which is an open access journal. They made all the figures available, all the supplementary uh, data available. You could even at home, if you have a 3D printer, you can go look up that paper, get the data and print your own baby Parasaurolophus skull because they wanted everybody to be able to access it. And that gets into all the other politics of who's paying for the science, should it be open access and all those sorts of debates. So that's something where there's always going to be some push pull about where that stuff lives. Yeah, because you'd think that uh, if I can can uh, non-consumptively scan a skull uh, of a crocodiliform, uh, mm -hmm. I can then just put it out there and say, hey, great, instead of you having to come by my lab and look at it, everybody can look at it because you can model it. But I know there might be some reasons that certain researchers are like, yeah, not quite yet. I'm not done with it. Right, exactly. That's some, the, the worries <laughs> about a claim jumping. It's called mm -hmm. that, you know, if you're studying a fossil and some people will hold on to fossils for years, if not decades, not wanting to put that data out there for exactly the same reason that somebody would download that, print their own skeleton, say, okay, these are all the anatomical points. Oh, it's a new species. I'll name it first. And then the person who actually discovered it is working on it. It's totally down the drain for them. So that's that's getting more into the politics of science of it. But sure. that's that certainly comes up in terms of, yeah, who is making the data and sharing it and who, who should have access to it. Excellent. Well, thank you for uh, for for giving us an insight in there. There's, there's some great links in our show notes too, uh, to examples of how people are using things like uh, micro CT and, and ground penetrating radar and, 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 and others uh, to, to find out and make finds basically. So check that out. Dailytechnewsshow.com. We've been talking lots of science and lots of tech all week on science week, and it continues in our discord and you can join the conversation in discord by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Daniel in Cincinnati had some thoughts, some theories, mind you, on why Free Stadia launched when it did, and not a moment sooner. Daniel says, my son wanted to get the highly anticipated Doom Eternal for his birthday. Unfortunately, I did not have high-end graphics card in our nine-year-old computer, so we 
couldn't download Doom on Steam. However, we could buy Doom Eternal on Stadia. I looked and looked around, couldn't find the free edition. So, defeated, I had to buy the 129 Premier Edition and Doom Eternal for $59 more. Now the Doom's been released, I can see why Stadia Free is now available. And I would have totally gotten the free version had I had the opportunity. By the way, it works great on our Intel Q6600 Quad 2.4 megahertz desktop computer. Nice. Uh, sometimes these things are just coincidences, but uh, it's hard to say. Hard <laughs> right. to say, Daniel. Yeah, I, I guess I get where you would be frustrated and be like, oh, I know what they did. They waited right. until I bought the whole thing before mm -hmm. they made it free. Yeah, convenient. Uh, because, convenient. Because uh, you still, even if you get the free Stadia, you still have to pay for Doom Eternal uh, either way. So, yeah, no, that's right. frustrating. I'm sorry to hear that, Daniel. Well, we hope you're enjoying Doom Eternal in any case. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Chris Allen, Jonathan Price, and Jeffrey Zilks. Also, thanks to Riley Black. Riley, you're bringing up the caboose of Science Friday. It was so awesome to have you. Let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you do. Sure, you can see all my writing uh, or where to find it at RileyBlack.net. And you can follow me on Twitter at Laylap, spelled L-A-E-L-A-P-S. Uh, folks, we've been taking this time at the end of the show to highlight uh, different creators and efforts uh, that we think you might enjoy, uh, and they might enjoy your looking at them. In fact, uh, the virtual Youper, who does the podcast that shall not be named, has really been stepping up his game because a bunch of you started listening uh, to his show after I mentioned it. So, you know, he he just wants people to enjoy his experiences and, and really appreciates that. Every month, I get cool buttons and postcards and fun stuff from Miss Carter Art. If you want to support a young artist and get cool stuff yourself, you should check her Patreon out at patreon.com slash Miss Carter Art. And if you know of a creator or other helpful project that deserves a little attention, email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And of course, you can always support us, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. Also, thank you for your feedback. We love getting feedback. In fact, we have an email address for just that. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live. If you can join us, please do. Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Lamar Wilson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>